Now, one of the pickiest bunch of people in the world of consumer interests are going to be those that are part of an enthusiast crowd. Now, these are the type of people that tend to be the most passionate, but also at times the hardest individuals to please. In addition, these smaller enthusiast groups might have a ton of fervor in their love for a product category, but by comparison to the mass market, there is simply not much money involved in comparison and just in comparison. But this is a concept and very much a reality in the world of watches as the watch enthusiast crowd tend to be a passionate one, but brands sometimes neglect their desires in many circumstances, given that there are different requests by say more mass market types of consumers. However, in this video, we're gonna be looking at some notable just points or circumstances where brands have actually catered more towards the enthusiast or collector crowd rather than the mass market. Now, as mentioned, this isn't always going to be in the brand's favor. And I think a lot of people are having kind of a myopic point of view when thinking about, hey, why don't brands make this or that? Uh, you have to really think about it from the perspective of is the person walking into that department store going to look at this watch and give it a second look? That's kind of what you have to keep in mind. But in this instance, we're gonna really look at brands that kind of had a pulse on what consumers wanted from the enthusiast crowd and gave them exactly what they wanted. So we're looking at six different circumstances. Some of them are gonna be exact models and other ones are going to be kind of looking at just a general uh, just overview and approach by the brand itself. Now, before we look at the first mention, a couple important points before we jump in here. New feature on teddybaldesser.com dedicated watch specialist consultation. So we now have uh, people available for actual just conversation around any watches that you're looking to purchase on our website. This was very important for me to set up as I think it's very important when buying a watch online to have kind of a simple, just traditional experience. The people that are gonna be taking those calls, one of the person that's leading many of them is Steven. He's worked at places like Tourneau, Omega Boutiques. He's been in the industry for over a decade and has dealt with many, many different brands and watches. Uh, so really my whole focus for this is to have watch nerds helping other watch nerds make a purchase. That's really what it's all about. In addition, we also launched two new brands from the Citizen Watch Group, one being Alpina, some great value for money pieces from that brand, like their Star Timer, as well as the Sea Strong Collection. And then also Frederic Constant, a brand that has really, I think, rejuvenated itself in the past few years in some of their new model releases, and have done a fantastic job. So very excited to be listing both of these brands on the site, so definitely go check those out as well. And just as an important note before getting into this video, I'm only going to be looking at brands that are, I would say, mass market brands. They have to have a nice slice of market share in the world of watches. They can't be micro brands, independent brands, or even brands that are kind of at that middle tier in terms of popularity, but I would say cater a bit more to an enthusiast crowd. So brands like a Zin, an Oris, or a Nomos, because they do have a tendency to cater a bit more to enthusiasts than a typical mass market brand would. Now for our first example on this list, we're going to be looking at Tudor. And there's probably a couple different options you could have thrown into the mix here, but the one that probably made the most sense to me were dealing with the Black Bay 58 and the Black Bay Chrono. So just to set the stage, now the Black Bay, and I did a video recently where I looked at kind of the history and progression of Tudor and talked about how when looking at Tudor or Rolex, the game has completely changed compared to decades ago. When the Black Bay was released in the early 2010s, it absolutely changed the game for Tudor in a variety of ways. It was originally launched with a variety of Eta calibers inside with the traditional smiley text at the six o'clock position as a great way to indicate that. And then quickly following that, they started developing their own in-house calibers, first unveiling something within the North flag and then gradually transitioning that into other models down the road. But when these in-house calibers made their way inside the 41 millimeter variants from the Black Bay family, they had the thickness at 15 millimeters, just shy of that. And that is a thick watch by any standard, let alone one with just a traditional three hand setup. Now some years had gone on and Tudor certainly received their good amount of probably feedback from consumers. And in 2018, this is really where I think they answered a big request from the enthusiast crowd. And that was with the announcement of the release of the Black Bay 58, the original black dial gilt uh, style that this one was really embodying. This brought a lot of great things to the table. It really leaned into, of course, the same heritage design that really became part of that newfound design identity from Tudor. But in addition to that, also was pricing these in-house movements in a competitive way. But most importantly, the wearability of this one was completely changed and changed how I think Tudor going forward was going to approach the wearability of their Black Bays throughout their entire collection. 
Now the 39 millimeters with the case diameter is one thing, but I think the universal thing that they got right with this one is the thickness. And with the Black Bay 58 shading off basically three millimeters of thickness from that case from those 41 millimeter variants, this really did open up the door. And then recently, as we've seen with the Black Bay Chronos, those also have reduced their thickness down from just around that 15 millimeters in thickness to 14.4 millimeters in thickness, which is a sizable jump, especially considering this is a chrono and just being more creative with the positioning of that movement within the actual case architecture itself. Now, I think this is a great example of a brand kind of listening or having a pulse on what consumers want, especially within the enthusiast crowd with the Black Bay 58s, as well as just the entire just adaption and change of the Black Bay collection as a whole. Now, next up, we have Tag Heuer. So people have a ton of affinity for the old Heuer brand, and at times, I think are probably a little bit unfairly hard on Tag Heuer as a result. Now, where Tag has managed to develop a nice nod from enthusiasts is when they lean into their iconic designs that originate back to the peak years of Hoyer's reign, mostly with the Carrera, Monaco, and Octavia models. Probably the best example of Hoyer doing this well is when we can look back to 2017 with the Hoyer Octavia reissue, where the brand developed a collector style voting bracket in 2016 by then chairman of the LVMH watch division, Jean-Claude Biver, uh, to have the collecting community determine what 1960s Octavia chronograph would be reissued the following year in 2017. Now that March Madness style tournament brought forth 16 Octavia references that were in the running and the winner was voted upon and it was the reference 2446 and served as the form of inspiration for that reintroduced piece in 2017. Now it's important to note from the price range around $2,000 to $6,000, Tag is, from a mass market perspective, one of the most known brands and probably the leading brand in that segment for talking about the mass market. Anybody that's just walking into a department store is going to be probably pretty familiar with Tag Heuer as a brand, and they've done a very good job with being positioned in that light. And for a brand like this to jump this far into the enthusiast circle, I think it's rather commendable. And these didn't sell as well as I think Tag envisioned them to sell. And we have kind of seen this general idea being continued with TAG and some of their other models, most recently with the Carrera limited editions that had just come out. Uh, so there's one celebrating 150 years. You also had that new green dial variant. I mean, talk about 2021 and being on play there uh, with the new green dial. It seems like everybody's doing that. But these models here with the Monaco, the Carreras, and the Octavias, that Octavia probably being the best representation of this, I think are where TAG really have leaned into it. And I'd like to see it more in the future, despite maybe sometimes not having the most uh, top dollar monetary interest involved. Now, next up we have Seiko. And Seiko is one of those brands that has one of the strongest followings among enthusiasts in the watch market, which is by no accident. By developing well-constructed and designed pieces at competitive prices, it really has become a brand that has sustained a following unmatched in the industry and almost like a cult-like following for certain models. Now, first off, Seiko defies much of what is the norm when it comes to a target price segment in the market. So let me kind of just explain here. Now, most brands will only key in and only offer products for a select price range. Like Omega, 95% of their products are gonna fall between $5,000 and $12,000. For Tudor, 95% of their products are gonna fall between $2,000 and $6,000. Or for a more attainable example, brand like Tissot operates typically between $300 and $1,500 for I would say 98% of their pieces with just a few outliers. And this is done for a reason. Brands wanna have a consistent image by the market and have an expectation that's represented by the brand and what they're offering with their products. If you start diluting all your offerings, sometimes that could be counterproductive. But when it comes to Seiko, they're pretty well versed across many price segments and it doesn't really have a negative effect in their kind of ability to sell. To begin, you can look at the attainable Seiko 5s that will retail around a couple hundred dollars. Then you also have Seiko that owns that area in that $500 range as a couple examples of this being the Cocktail Times, the Turtles, the Samurais. And again, as you get closer to $1,000, you can look at the Sumos and the Alpinist models. And then also, even when you get above $1,000, you've seen this a lot in the last uh, several, probably couple, no, just a couple years, I would say, especially with the Seiko Willards. And then also the popular release of those SPB 140s. So the SPB 143 as an example there being some of the more beloved models in that price range around $1,000 for a dive watch. And unlike other brands that lean more attainable, they also have things in their Marine Masters and their LX models that go for thousands of dollars and still have a following among collectors and people that buy them. 
Uh, it's not everybody, but just the ability to stretch yourself out to have an answer for everybody in the market, I think is such an enthusiast move and something you do not see from a mass market brand. And Seiko is a mass market brand. Also Seiko really keys into what I would say an audience wants uh, quite a bit from the different model releases among the Alpinist collection, maybe, maybe even more than what was required since there are just so many people that love the JDM models of the Alpinist across the globe. And they just unveiled like three different just model families within the Alpinist collection to really be an answer to that. Also, you could look at the releases of the Arnie and the Willard as previously mentioned, as they kind of lend into listening to that enthusiast. And I think it's a powerful just move when it comes to a mass market distribution brand like Sago. For the next brand on our list, we have Timex. And this is really going to key into one 2017 release with the Timex Marlin. Now up to this point, I wouldn't say completely up to this point, but at that period of time, say in 2015 to 2017, Timex was a brand that was commonly known for many of their just very affordable quartz watches that are very loud with their ticking and of course have some heritage in creating these watches that I think are just set it and forget it type of timepieces. But if you look back at Timex's actual heritage and back to the 1960s, Timex did have a selection of some automatic watches and a whole history of creating mechanical watches that made a ton of sense and probably was a good thing to revisit. Now it took some time for this to be the case, but Timex decided to take, a, I wouldn't say a risk, but maybe seen as a risk at the time in creating the 2017 hand winding version of the Timex Marlin. Now we are coming out of the 2000s, the early 2010s, where people like large watches, the mechanical watch enthusiast market was growing, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say as established that we've seen in the last three to four years. It has grown quite a bit since I started posting here on YouTube. And just for context, people had an idea about what Timex was, but it wasn't for mechanical watches to any degree in a modern context. And also this watch was 34 millimeters in diameter, something that really leaned into vintage wearing dimensions to say the least. But this watch was absolutely a complete hit and kind of opened the floodgates for Timex going forward. So this is one of those rare instances where a watch that was catering to a specific enthusiast crowd actually ended up being a great move for a brand in terms of actually getting sales. And I think Timex knocked it out of the park. Following this watch, we saw the release of many other watches that I would say were of this ilk. You could also, of course, look at the very direct model with the Timex Marlin Automatic that would come a little bit later and have a 40 millimeter case and the day date to follow. And then in addition to that, the very popular Timex Q and the M79 that kind of work off that same architecture and kind of retro 1970s, 80s vibes that people do love as well. And in a way, this Timex Marlin almost changed the way that I would say consumers or at least people in the enthusiast crowd looked at Timex forever going forward or at least have since. Now next up we have Omega and the model that we're gonna be looking at specifically was the reintroduction of the 321 movement from the brand. Now this one's a bit more controversial for a reason I'll mention in a bit, but this certainly was a play into the collector or enthusiast crowd with the introduction of this uh, movement once again. So just for some actual context, the Speedmaster of course has been immortalized as a result of uh, the connection to NASA and being one of the leading chronographs on the market for decades. In 1957, the 321 manual wine caliber was unveiled within the Speedmaster and it became really that beloved movement from the brand. It was a manual wine caliber featuring a column wheel and also from the looks department was a very attractive looking movement, one of probably the most beloved movements and also the connection to the NASA space program made this a truly beloved movement. And there was a lot of just rumors spurring around and just circulating as time would go on. But what people really wanted to see was a new stainless steel Speedmaster with a 321 movement inside. And this finally happened with the release of the Ed White in early parts of pretty much right around the turn of the new year of 2020. The watch really keyed into a lot of the aspects that I think I would say collectors would love. Of course, the first thing would be the 321 movement on the inside. You also have the Speedmaster bracelet that was more in line with the period and also some adapted wearing dimensions to make this one wear a bit smaller. Now where the controversy comes in is really with the price at $14,000 for the price of this one, 
that I think is the reason why this one's a bit more difficult to really push as a great just representation of thinking about the enthusiast because every other aspect, this watch is so great in terms of how it's able to cater to this crowd, but also on the, on the flip side, it is a rather expensive one and is kind of keying into a specific type of collector. So laid that out there, but no question, this is a watch that does kind of cater to that community. And for our final brand here, we have Breitling. And this one is gonna be a bit more, I would say, abstract in regards to uh, their approach as the brand kind of just progressed throughout the 2010s mostly. So if you look back at models being released by Breitling in the, say like the 2000s or the early 2010s, it would be easy to recognize a couple of trends. One, they were all large, like very large, nearly always in excess of 45 millimeters, and they had a bling to them that became a bit showy at times. Now, Breitling being a brand that has an incredible history and its contribution to pilot watches, divers, and chronographs, certainly, but in certain aspects of their history and just in this range of time, I would say some would probably argue that they lost their way in some aspects, as well as losing their way in kind of hitting certain parts of their customer base as the world was increasingly wanting uh, that trend of larger watches, kind of foregoing size for design or function and opting instead for size and loudness for just grabbing attention instead. Now in the last five years though, I think this is where Breitling has just undergone quite a bit of change, both in ownership, leadership, and the products that they were releasing. And part of this I think has allowed them to kind of cater a bit more to enthusiasts. I think a few examples of this would be the new collection of Premier B01 pieces with the new B01 movement inside that played uh, off that kind of panda style chronograph that has become increasingly popular. In addition, introductions to new generations of the chronomats that lean into that retro look with contemporary finish and the movement as well. Also opting to think outside the box and moving away from, I would say one of the criticisms of that period that I was kind of discussing with using a lot of traditional third-party movements off the shelf and collaborating with Tudor to exchange some technologies by offering the B01 as a base caliber for Tudor uh, that was seen in their Black Bay Chrono. And in turn for utilizing some of Tudor's MT movements with the Super Ocean Heritage as an example. And if you look at Breitling on the surface now compared to what they were even 10 years ago, very hard to even recognize. Of course, there's going to be the same type of models that are going to be there. You have your Navar timers, you have your Super Oceans, and, and things of that sort. But just how they've been able to adapt many of their design elements, and also I would say some of their philosophy with a lot of changing structure, I would say they've definitely catered a bit more to enthusiasts in these last five years. All right guys, now those are a few instances that I've noticed where brands have catered more towards enthusiasts than normal. Uh, where are some other just instances where you've seen this? I'd love to see comments down below and any ones that I have missed specifically. Also, if you have enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon. It's a great way to help out the channel. Also definitely take advantage of that watch consultation feature on teddybaldestar.com, full authorized dealer of now over 30 brands on our site, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, full warranty for any of the products that we carry that you purchase, as you'll be completely covered if anything goes wrong. Then finally, nine out of every $10 that we generate goes back into this content that we are creating here. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram and myself there, uh, posting some great photos of watches, at least I'd like to think so. Uh, so definitely go check that out. It's a great way to stay up to date with the content and have a little bit more of a personal connection as well as we're kind of progressing over there. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.